Hi, this is Estelle Erasmus, your host for Freelance Writing Direct. In this short, soundbite-filled podcast, I'll cover everything the freelance and creative writer and author needs to do to move forward with their writing, their creativity, and their career. Through conversations with guests, we'll cover tips, tricks and actionable strategies. So join me every week and grow your business and build your craft with Freelance Writing Direct. And don't forget to subscribe, rate and review on iTunes and Spotify. Welcome everybody to Freelance Writing Direct. I'm your host, Estelle Erasmus, and today I am so excited and thrilled and beyond to have the wonderful, talented Anne Hood with us in an episode that I'm calling Flying High with author, storyteller Anne Hood. And we're going to talk a lot about her wonderful memoir, Fly Girl. So I want to tell you a little bit about Anne. When she was in seventh grade, she read a book called How to Become an Airline Stewardess that fueled her desire to see the world. And this is in her words. And that's what I did when I graduated from URI. I went to work for TWA as a flight attendant. Back then, I thought you needed adventures in order to be a writer. Of course, I know now that all you need, as Eudora Welty said, is to sit on your own front porch. But I did see a lot of the world with TWA, and I moved from Boston to St. Louis and finally to NYC, a place I dreamed of living ever since I watched Doris Day movies as a little girl. I wrote my first novel, Somewhere Off the Coast of Maine, on international flights and on the train to the plane, which was the subway out to JFK. It was published in 1987. Since then, I've published in the New York Times, the Paris Review, O Bon Appetit, Tin House, The Atlantic Monthly, Real Simple, and other wonderful places. And I've won two Pushcart Prizes, two Best American Food Writing Awards, Best American Spiritual Writing and Travel Writing Awards, and a Boston Public Library Literary Light Award. So, Anne, <laughs> you are so prolific, and I'm so excited to talk to you today. I'm excited to be here. Thanks for having me. So let's get right into your book. You wrote this wonderful coming of age memoir, Fly Girl. And you talk about being a flight attendant. And I quote from your prologue, I had the unique experience of starting as a flight attendant at the end of those glamour days. And we're talking yeah. about the glamour days of flying and stopping just as service, legroom and meals began to disappear. I flew through the start of deregulation and oil crisis, massive furloughs, startup airlines, corporate takeovers, and a labor strike. I didn't see it all, but I saw a lot. <laughs> yeah, for sure. <laughs> it's funny because I remember the musical company, and we all see the people getting off of the plane, yeah. the trains, the buses. Right. And it was such a glamorous time. And that's when you were flight attendant. But you also go into the underbelly of the industry and really get into the nitty gritty details of what it took from you having to maintain your weight of 135 pounds uh -huh. to all the regulations that you had to follow. So in some ways, it was an easier, definitely more glamorous times. But in other ways, there was a lot of subjugation of women. But you were young and, and just starting out. Why did you pick this particular time container that you set your story in? Well, you know, I, it's been decades since I worked for TWA. During that labor strike, we all lost our jobs. By that time, my first book was coming out. And so I just kind of transitioned, I was lucky, into being a full-time writer. And ever since then... Anytime someone finds out of, that I was a flight attendant, their ears perk up. There's so many questions. It's a job that still maintains, I think, a certain mystique. People are really curious about it. 
but I felt for all those years that I just had a series of anecdotes, you know, funny things that happened or scary things that happened, but I didn't feel it was a story. And it wasn't until with the lens of all these years that I realized, number one, and you said it so beautifully, it's a coming of age story. I was a 21 year old kid with a Dorothy Hamill haircut and Bonnie Bell lip gloss um, when I got hired and I emerged eight years later as someone who had traveled all over the world, who looked sophisticated, who could walk in a room and talk to anybody, who could save lives, who could make a great martini and open a bottle of champagne, things I didn't have those skills when I started. And so I realized those eight years of my life actually made me the person I am, the woman I am now. And that's why I chose to tell the story finally and to focus on the days, because even now, and we we see what airplanes are like now, we see what flight attendants, how hard they work and how different the standards are for flight attendants. And many of that is good. <laughs> you know, they're not put under the same restraints that we were, but we still think of it as a glamorous job. And it was. And so I wanted to write about that, but also what was behind the glamour, like what it took to look that way, to get trained, the, the toll it took on your body flying. I flew international for years and you know, I didn't know if it was day or night ever, but all of the things and how hard the job was to get and to maintain and to learn. So there was so much packed in those eight years of my life that it just I just knew it would be an interesting book. And it also started a beautiful love affair with passenger 47F. 47F, five years. So it was a pretty long, the longest yeah. relationship I'd had at that point. I had six roommates and that was easy because we were never all, it was rare if we were all home because we're always flying off, returning, getting called to the airport. It was just this heady, hectic time. And they always had these great dates. And every date I went on was a dud <laughs> until 47F. <laughs> and, and that was even like a decade or, or more before that book, Coffee, Tea, or Me, which kind of, was it, was that around the same time or was it a little bit later? That kind Coffee, of- Coffee, Tea, or Me came out of, in the 60s. And okay. I was hired in 1978. It's a funny story about the book, as I say in Fly Girl, but it was written by a man. And he used the pseudonym of two fake airline stewardesses. And I read it, you know, it was one of those secret books you kind of read under your desk and certain pages were folded over, then you passed it on to your friend. I reread it when I was writing Fly Girl and it is so sexist. There's illustrations in it. I, I didn't remember those, but of like busty flight attendants and like mini skirts and yeah, yeah. So it certainly didn't help the image of flight attendants. It, you know, it kept that idea of sex kittens in the sky. But I love the 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 way that you phrase it, that you were 21 year old, very naive mm -hmm. girl wanting to see the world. You really had this idea of wanting to see the world. And it's so interesting that, and not surprising that you became a writer because through writing, you set a lens into the world of yes. your own making. And I guess you had to have these experiences to even build up your confidence and your <sighs> wanting to. Absolutely. You know, I grew up in a very small town in the smallest state, which is Rhode Island. And I don't know why, but I just was a kid with stars in her eyes. I just wanted some a big life. I think a lot of it was from Saturday afternoon at the movies. You know, you saw these, these women arrive in New York City in these beautiful Chanel suits and the pillbox hats. And it just looked so glamorous. And I didn't really know how to do that. You know, where, how do you get that big life? I went to University of Rhode Island. So 30 miles from where I grew up, you know, I went off to college, but I still did my laundry at home on the weekends. You know? <laughs> and I had this desire to be a writer since I read Little Women when I was in second grade. And I just thought, I want to write a book like this because it was the first novel I read with chapters and it covered so many years. So I had that desire, but I even knew as a kid, I don't have anything to write about. You know, I live in the sheltered existence, a big Italian family, no privacy. Everything you did was shared with everybody, Sunday dinners, and it was all wonderful. And of course, you know, when you get older, you realize I'd give anything for one of those Sunday meals again. But at the time it was suffocating. Sure. And when I read that book, How to Become an Airline Stewardess, which the first line was also kind of convinced me I wanted the job. The first line was, 
do you want a boyfriend in every city in the world? <laughs> I was like, you bet I do. <laughs> I love that. I love that. But I just latched onto that idea, you know, that that would give me the, show me the big world. And it did. And it did. I mean, there's so much that you talk about in the book. You talk about your stories, but you also meld it with research and information and data yeah. on the airline industry. It's rise, it's fall, it's, you know, <laughs> all that. And you also added in a very sad moment in your life when your when your brother Skip passed away. Yes. And later you've had other moments of loss in your life that you've written about a lot. Yes. You kind of ended up specializing through no fault of your own in yes. writing a grief and loss. Can you talk about, you know, you were in the middle and that comes in towards kind of like the latter part of the book, because I believe at that time you already had a writing contract or you had started to write. Can yes, you I was working on my first novel somewhere yeah. up the coast of Maine. And as you said, writing it on the subway, writing it in hotels all over Europe because I always had jet lag. So, you know, I'd fall asleep and then I'd wake up yeah. and I would write my book. But I was actually on a layover in L.A. when I got the call that my brother had died in an accident, a household accident. Just a few months earlier, I was on a flight to Paris and there was a man. And it, 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 so it was so interesting when those lights are dimmed on long flights and passengers try to sleep or go to sleep. And the flight attendant goes into the galley and, you know, either reads or eats their own dinner or whatever. People come and they want to talk and, and they don't want to, it's not like a pickup thing. It's yeah. like, there's something about, I'm never going to see this person again. We're strangers. The lights are dim. It's safe. It's cozy. And I, I heard so many stories about people's lives, but this man came in and he wanted a couple scotches. He was clearly upset. And he told me quickly that his brother had died. Mm -hmm. And here I was, I was 25 years old. I had never experienced anything like that. I couldn't imagine what he was feeling. And I, I didn't really know what to do, though I did what I later learned was the exact right thing was just let him talk, you know, not try to fix it, not say banal things, but just listen, mm -hmm. express your sympathy. And then a few months later, I was that person on the plane who was going home because my brother had died. And the irony just always stayed with me. Did it change your writing, experiencing that deep loss that early, you know, in your young adulthood? Oh, it sure did. You know, I was writing these stories, connected short stories. But after my brother died, I realized I, I got this, I, I got a focus because, and that book was somewhere off the coast of Maine, the first novel that came out in 1987 that you mentioned. My brother was five years older than me. And he was, I guess, a hippie. I don't know that, you know, it sounds funny, but he was old enough when he went off to college, you know, he got, he grew a beard and he got a Volkswagen bug and he looked kind of grubby and, you know, his girlfriend wore beads. And I was like kind of that classic sixties image. And it seemed so romantic to me and his friends all had the long hair and, you know, did interesting things and read interesting books. And they were really seekers, spiritual seekers. And they passed those books on to me. So, his friends and him and that generation just had a huge impact on me. By the time I went to college, all that was over. <laughs> but when he died, I wanted to kind of capture what I had felt. And so it kind of shifted the focus of the book to people who had gone to college at the time he went. And I could, you know, create characters. Nobody's based on anyone in particular, but just it helped me figure out characters who wanted those things and who strived for those things and yeah. that really set the book off it, it gave you a different view in a way from exactly. your kind of sheltered yeah because yeah. you know I think like so many new writers yeah. your first novel often is just your own story yes. you know you, you disguise you mask things and I was pretty much doing that but when he died I I realized I was reading differently because I was reading books that might help me with my grief, not help self-help books, but novels. And I realized if I want to write a story that matters, I have to write about the hard stuff, not my beef with my neighbor or, you know, my crush on a boy or whatever. And it just shifted 
what I wanted to do as a writer and what kind of stories I wanted to write. Hi, this is Estella Rasmus, your host, and I'm the author of Writing That Gets Noticed, Find Your Voice, Become a Better Storyteller, Get Published which is available for pre-order from New World Library. And if you send me a receipt showing that you have ordered the book, I am happy to send you my 10 best writing tips. Email me at freelancewritingdirect at gmail.com. And I can't wait for you to read the book. You talk about the grit, you know, that needed to succeed, even as a flight attendant. And I feel like somewhere in there, you also equate it with writing because writing takes, as we know, it takes a lot of grit as well. Yes. You know, there's yes. glory when the book is published and you're out there speaking and all that. But what people don't see, and I guess they don't need to see, is those days when you're hunched by your computer or writing feverishly, writing your notes or doing your deep research that might not be the most exciting thing at the moment to you, but you know that it's going to inform your work. Right. So how do you, can you equate the two in, in a way? Yeah, you know, it's interesting. That's a really good point. I always think the image of myself as a flight attendant that I kind of still dream about that I like is, you know, we had beautiful Ralph Lauren designed uniforms and we had to wear high heels and we had our little rolly bags and getting on a 747, there would be like 14 or 16 of us. So this crew of really pulled together people, men and women, getting on that beautiful plane, walking down the TWA red carpet and stepping on this beautiful plane. And that's the image that I had as a kid. And that's the one I love still. But the truth is my hands were often in garbage, <laughs> literal garbage. <laughs> you know, people were mad at us because we were late or it was snowing or, you know, whatever. The, their bags were lost. I was sticky all the time because it was the days when cans opened with a pop top. You used to have to pull the top off and it sprayed and you had Coke and ginger ale all over, you know, and you'd have to run in the bathroom all the time, reapply the deodorant, reapply the lipstick and come back out. You'd be filthy when you got off that plane. And you had to do things like take care of drunk passengers, air sick passengers. You know, you were getting those air sick bags handed to you from mothers with little kids. And so that was the, the side that people don't see. And that was probably more of the job than the walking through the, the terminal looking great, you know? And I guess just what you said about writing is true. People don't realize that, you know, for me, I'm in my pajamas most of the day, either writing like the wind or pulling my hair out because I'm stuck. I'm trying to get information. I research even novels that are contemporary because I'm always writing about something that I don't know that much about that I want to learn about or share. So it's a lot of research, a lot of note taking. I mean, it's funny. I could show you, I get poster board and I make these big charts and Although it's fun, people don't think about that when they buy a beautiful book with a beautiful cover and the writer is dressed up with her lipstick on signing it, you know, it's, but what, what it took. And for me to write a novel takes three to five years. So it's every day doing the other stuff for a very long time. For your process, some people write a page a day. I can't do it. I mean, I, I just don't. I don't have that in me, but some people do that. Some people just write notes on their phones and some people do like, what's your process? I'm fascinated about that. You know, th this is a really important question for people who want to be writers or who are writing your process. I spent a long time doing what other people told me I should do. One was you have to write two hours a day when you first wake up. Well, I'm not a morning person. And I was like, I don't know if this is going to be the job for me. I don't want to get up for the rest of my life at like five in the morning. But I dutifully tried because I'm just that person who when I want something, I will try to get it. I'll do whatever it takes. It took me a long time to realize some, some really important things. Number one, one of the most important parts of being a writer is reading and to grant myself permission to read for two hours an afternoon, you know, was really a big step. I think women in particular take it upon themselves that they have to, you know, perform in certain ways and do certain things and not give themselves time, you know, like a room of our own kind of thing. I need to read every day. I need to write every day, but sometimes that's in my head. You know, sometimes it's just planning or living with the character. 
And if I'm not actually at my computer, I don't force myself to write. I can take a big walk. I live in New York City. I can walk out the door, take a nice big walk to a bookstore, to the grocery store, whatever, and live in my novel. That counts. You know, it took me a long time to realize and again, give myself permission. And a lot of people, they need to do something physical. They need to work out or swim or whatever. But most of what I like to do is interior stuff. And so I also knit every day because knitting is my savior. And so for me, a perfect day <laughs> yeah, <laughs> is writing two hours, reading two hours and knitting two hours. And I feel like I've had a full day. All of those things feed my imagination, feed my writing and help me feel like I accomplished something. And I love that you said, Anne, that writing isn't just sitting at the computer because our brains are always working and we're always thinking. And I feel yeah. that you're you're so right on that. Like I could be watching bad reality TV and then come back to something. Exactly. Yes. Exactly. And, and people don't think that. They think, especially beginner writers, they think I have to put my butt in the chair and just do it until it comes. Yes. And, you know, for some people, and again, that's why the idea of your own process matters. Yeah. I have heard many writers say that what they need to do is sit in the same spot at the same time of day for a certain amount of time. And that's how they write. I couldn't do that. You know, I feel like for me, writing isn't a schedule in my head. I need to learn my story, live with my characters, and then write when I, I often say I'm a volcano writer. I write when it feels like the top of my head's going to blow off if I don't finally get this story on the page. That's a great way of putting it. <laughs> I like that. I think I might be a volcano writer too. There's a I, lot of us out there. We don't, you don't hear about them as much as the people sit down every day and write for five hours or whatever. I am going to write that and put it on a <laughs> sticky on my computer because I love that. Okay. So did you get any blowback from your story? I mean, look, you wrote about TWA and Capital, which are defunct. They're yes, gone. You right. didn't get the job with United. So that <laughs> might have been a problem if you were exactly. if you're writing about United, which is still around. But these are kind of long gone. So probably not, I, right? I have only gotten the most lovely emails about this book. Flight attendants have come out of the woodwork. People that, I mean, from every airline, people who flew before me, who are flight attendants now. I will say that people of my era and earlier always write saying how glad they were to revisit those days and to kind of have a place that kind of is preserving them somehow, like a, an active thing, a book, not a museum, but a book, something they can relate to. So I haven't really had any any negative responses. Everybody's been loving it. I say flight attendants in particular. For example, Eastern Airlines retired flight attendants in New York City invited me to their monthly luncheon. It's on the Upper East Side. And if you know New York at all, I'm in the West Village. And it's one of the hardest places to get from the West Village to the Upper East Side. It takes so much time. And so I said to my husband, oh, I've got to go to the Upper East Side, you know, and, but it's a luncheon and I'll be back by two. Five o'clock, I'm still with them. Flight attendants are friendly. They love to laugh. They know how to be in a crowd. Everybody just was right back in it, and I was too. It was like being on a layover with your friends. I stayed. We drank a lot of wine. We ate great food. We shared stories. It was one of the best things I've done. So things like that have happened, you know, which has been fabulous. It's like being a member of a club forever. That yes. You can always, and you said in the book that whenever you go to a writing conference, and your first, I think, was bread loaf, but whenever yes. you go to a writing conference and speak at one, there's a flight attendant in the audience always. who's trying to become a writer. Always, yes. Yeah, you know, there are some famous writers who were flight attendants that people maybe didn't know. Mary Higgins Clark was a Delta stewardess, and a writer named Barbara Raskin, who had a huge bestseller in the 80s, was a stewardess. There's a lot of us out there. Well, you are such a prolific writer and you're so well-versed and you've written for so many places. I know that our watchers and listeners are so interested in hearing some of your writing tips about telling a compelling story and you're a writing teacher as well. Yes. Well, I think, and when I teach, I make sure this is built into the curriculum. I said it, you need to read to be a writer, but I can't stress it enough. And by that, I, I mean... 
read magazines, read what magazines are publishing what, read columns in newspapers that have guest writers. You have to sort of know a little bit about a lot of things so that you know, cast your net wide, so that you know if you do want to write an essay or a short story, who's publishing them and what kind of things they're looking for. I've heard so many editors say that the mo one of the most frustrating things is someone sends a science fiction story to a literary journal or you know some kind of they didn't do their homework so just build reading into your day and um, but you also are learning from it so when i get stuck or i'm starting a new project the first thing i do is read books like the one i want to write so when i wrote my book the knitting circle it felt like a huge challenge because i knew it was going to be eight women and that they were they were all going to have their point of view but they were also all going to be together. And I thought, how am I going to do that? Who's the protagonist? Like, how do I figure this out? So I read The Joy Lock Club because I knew that that was a group. And I read a book by Whitney Otto called How to Make an American Quilt. My book and those, those two books are completely different from each other. But it was just, how do I manage this crowd that I'm writing about? How did they do it? Alternating chapters. How did they use the protagonist? So it just reading helps you write. So that's my number one tip always. And then don't talk about your idea, just write it. I feel like people lose steam with their, with their novels in particular because they keep telling the story to people. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm not secretive, but I do keep it close until I have a draft because I, I, it can also get derailed, right? Like you're telling people and they're like, oh, so then she runs away and you're like, oh no, I wasn't gonna do that. And then you don't know what to do, your idea or what the people expect. Just be private, I think. I, I agree. And what about, do you have any, do you title your work? Like if you're writing an essay, do you title it before you write it or as you write it? How does that work? You, you know, I, it's funny. I used to really have trouble with titles and my books were often untitled, but I learned over making that mistake that if I have a title, it helps me stay focused. Mm -hmm. And sometimes the title changes, but not usually. So even for a short story or an essay, I like to have a title. With essays, the publication may change, may ask you if they can change it, but it still helps me for writing. Sure. For me, my most important thing, and I spend the most time on, and this is gonna sound wild, is my first line. It can take me three months to get my first, and I can't write until I have the exact one I want. I think that's fascinating because you wanna hook the reader right away, and you're doing that with your first line. It, the first line, has a big, I think it has the biggest responsibility, except for arguably the last line. And I feel like they're connected. So, you know, being, having been an English major, I really believe that every story is kind of, you're telling the odyssey, it, your character's on a journey and they're going to change in the course of the journey. And so if I know my first line, I understand that my protagonist is going to be in an opposite place at the end of the book. And if I don't know the first line, how do I know where I'm going? Can you share some of your first lines? Do you remember them? Like, for Well, them? I'll tell you again, the knitting circle, I guess that one's on my mind today. <laughs> I have a hat I want to finish this afternoon and I know I'm not going to be able to. So I think that's why knitting is on my mind. I needed to have a first line also kind of telegraphs what the whole book's about. And so for the knitting circle, the first line is Mary showed up empty handed. That's it. Why was that? the one I landed on. And why did that propel me to write the rest of the book? Because the day before she wasn't showing up for anything. So this is the day something changed. Mm. Empty handed, yes, but she was also empty inside. So that word just told us, this is a person who's got nothing to give, but it's the day she shows up for something. And so now we're gonna get the story going. You know, you don't write about all the days she stayed in bed or was crying or didn't leave her house. I, I always say Humpty Dumpty sat on the wall a long time, but we don't read about him until he falls. And so I think your first line is that change. That's fantastic. The inciting incident, if you will, yeah. what it is. And then, so the ending, she's going to have something, right? She's going to yes. have something. In, at the end she's teaching someone how to knit and she's holding an abundance of yarns, yarn. It's like falling out of her arms. So no longer empty handed. The yarn is like a metaphor for all she has now. 
And yeah. she's giving something to someone. She's not just showing up. She's yeah. actually helping. You're a master of the objective correlative. <laughs> it's one of my favorite <laughs> topics. Don't get me started. <laughs> Actually, I have a book coming out, and I mentioned you in there as being a master. Oh Carlton. my gosh, that is funny. Can you talk a little bit about that? The challenge of that question is a little bit, but yes, I will. It's <laughs> funny. I had a writing workshop at a conference, and they showed up the last day with T-shirts saying, "Anne Hood taught me the objective relative," <laughs> because I talk about it. I want lot. that T-shirt. <laughs> So it's really something that I think a lot of writers do without knowing there's a name for it. So it's not a big secret. It's not my trick. It, it is simply using an object or an event to stand in for an emotion. So you, you never want to, I never say never, but you almost never want to write something like, I felt sad. She was nervous. You want to show it, right? You don't want to use that feeling word all the time. And the objective correlative helps you do that. So for me in the knitting circle, it was yarn. Anytime the, the main character was in a pinch or emotionally upset, I used the knitting to show what she was feeling. T.S. Eliot is the person who coined the phrase. He borrowed it, but he's the one in an essay about Hamlet in which he argues that Hamlet is a failed play because what does Hamlet do? He gets up in his big soliloquy and he talks about to be or not to be. He talks about what he's feeling. Whereas in Macbeth, Shakespeare uses the objective correlative. When there's thunder, you know, danger's coming. When Lady Macbeth washes her hands, we know she feels guilty. Um, when the witches come on stage, you know, there's trouble. And so he compares the two plays. The essay is pretty dry. So if you want to read it, you can get it online. I think I just took the most exciting parts of it for you. But then about 10 years later, the poet William Carlos Williams in his poem Patterson has this line, no ideas, but in things. And that kind of married the objective correlative to that line. And honestly, I think years later, it became the, the workshop cliche of show, don't tell. No <laughs> ideas, but in things. I love that. And you, I'm going to segue now. You have another claim to fame. You, have, uh -oh. <laughs> you are the writer who I think has been on the revered column, Modern Love, more than <laughs> Else. I believe, and I might be wrong, it's four times. Now I need a place to hide away about the sad story of connecting to the Beatles and losing your, your daughter, Grace, to nurture again with courage about your adopted daughter, Annabelle. I married Republican. There, I said it. I think that's about your ex. <laughs> yes, I divorced a Republican. <laughs> right. That's, that's the next one. <laughs> And what's love? Don't ask the answer couple. Also about your ex in a column that both of you did for years in Glamour magazine. Right. So look, I mean, people <laughs> are trying desperately to get into modern love. So many people want that because it is a doorway to other opportunities, to getting accolades and notice from their writing. And you'd already had an amount of notice and acclaim. Yeah or even being in modern love. But can you share just a few pieces of advice on how to get your 1,700 words <laughs> into that column with the wonderful Dan Jones yeah. and Neely as well? You know, I wish there was a secret that I could tell the world, and I would, though Dan wouldn't be happy, I think, if there was one and I spilled the beans. I don't know what it is. You know, it's funny because when I was interviewing to be a flight attendant, they would always say, Yes, we want you to look a certain way. We want you to have a certain personality, but there's an intangible thing that we can't describe that we're looking for. And that is the same with modern love. There is something that he wants and he reads them all. I mean, so Dan is the one choosing. After my third one, he said, you can't, I can't publish any more of you. You know, you have too many, like done. Two is usually the limit. And I was like, okay. And then I wrote this essay, the answer couple. And I, I wrote to him and I said, I know, you, I know you can't take it, but it just seems like a modern love. 
And he says, I can't believe you did it to me again. Not only do I love it, but I have a, a spot in two weeks that I need to fill. So not only did he take it, but it went right in, which was crazy, right? Wow. I know that he doesn't like stories about that are focused mainly on the past, like an old love. It's gotta be more like, how's that affecting you now? So you have to write about something that is you now, of course the past may affect you now, but I will say somewhere online, there is a great interview with him where he outlines what he wants. Yeah. And I've given it to students. I don't know. I can't give any more advice. I don't know why the essays I write just fit there. And I'm not sure why. I mean, I think they're very real. They're very open. They're very honest. They don't give everything away, but they give the important things away. Right, right. right. And I did notice that, like you said, the modernness of it. I had a friend who was a very good writer and he sent me, he said, what do you think of this modern love essay? Do you think they'd like it? And I, it was a good essay. And I said, I don't know. It's all in the past about like this girlfriend when you were 16. And although he was tangentially connecting it to like, and that's what, who I, the woman I'm looking for now, not literally, but it was really about that. And in fact, when he got rejected with a nice letter from Dan, because this is a published writing, you know, a pretty well-known writer, it was like, we don't write, want the story of your childhood or your teen love unless it matters now. That that makes so much sense. Yeah. I understand you also have a book out now, a, a YA book. Clementine. Yes. Yeah, Clementine. Can you talk just a little bit about that? Yeah. You know, I've, I've published like two or three other YA or middle grade books yes. with Penguin Workshop, wonderful editor there. And they just like my voice. And I've been lucky that to have this opportunity. It's not something I would have just done. Mm -hmm. But they approached me a few years ago to see if I was ready, even though my daughter Grace died in 2002. So it's been a long time. But if I was ready to write about that from a kid's point of view. And so I wrote a book called Jude Banks Superhero. And it's about a boy whose sister has died and how his family gets through, but really how he gets through it and what it's like for him. And one of the things he does is go to a grief group called City of Angels, where kids go when they've lost a sibling. And one of the characters in the grief group really struck my editor. And he said, I want her to have a book. And so Clementine is a slightly older kid in that group. She, City of Angels only comes up once, but it's her story and about her sister dying, but it's really about her depression. So it's a book about a kid who's depressed and at sea and the wrong things she does and how she helps herself ultimately. I love it. I'm so proud of it. It's really, it's really, especially after the pandemic, which isn't what it was about at all, but so many kids have anxiety and depression that I think it's such an important book to be out now and for kids to read. So I'm really excited about it. That's wonderful. And I'm sure it'll help so many people. I hope so. Yes. So Anne, this has been a magnificent chat with you. We have <laughs> covered you. your book, your books, your modern love, your advice, <laughs> and so much more. You always have something going on, it seems. So what is next for you? So, you know, Fly Girl just came out in paperback. So I'm doing a lot of events for that. But I'm really excited that I have a new adult novel coming out next summer called The Stolen Child. And it's been five or six years in the writing. So I am so happy it's finally going to be in bookstores. It's an epic story. It moves from World War I to 1971 and covers the whole idea of a stolen child and loss, giving away your child, trying to find a child you gave away. It's just epic. It covers many countries, lots of characters. It's a big book and I'm really excited about it. Was it inspired by your experience adopting your daughter, Annabelle? You know, I think not directly. I did write a book called The Red Thread that was really about adoption and international adoption, a novel. Yeah. But I think it has a lot of all the topics that I explored. So yes, that losing my daughter. I mean, it started because one day I was crying and I said to myself, I wonder how many tears I have cried in my life. I wish I could collect them and put them in a museum. And so a thread through it is this museum of tears in Italy. I made it up, but it was all the things people cry for. And some of them are happy. 
And so it really covers a big emotion. I mean, this book is an epic. It's really big. Well, you're going to have to come back on the program and talk I will. about it. I hope it. you like it and I will go back and talk about it. Oh, that's wonderful. Thank you so much, Anne, for being my guest today. It's been such a pleasure talking to you. Thank you so much. I had such fun. I hope I see you again soon. Have a great day. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Follow me at EstelleSErasmus.com on my website and on social media, which is Instagram, TikTok, and Twitter at Estelle S. Erasmus. And we're now on YouTube for Freelance Writing Direct. And if you're interested in sponsoring an episode or two or doing an episode takeover, please email me at freelancewritingdirect at gmail.com. Follow along and soon everyone will be reading what you're writing.